<laughs> All right. I'm going to turn it over to the worship team now, right after a quick prayer. Father, we want to thank you so much just for who you are. We want to thank you, Father, that we have a team in place that can continue our worship service to bring you glory, to worship you. And we thank you, Father, for watching over Matt while he's ill, to bring him back to us safely so that we can enjoy his company once again. Right now, we just lift up this worship time to glorify your name. And we ask that you be with everybody who's involved, whether they're speaking, playing music, singing, or whether they're just watching from the pew, from the chairs, or online. We ask that the Spirit be involved in everything that we do here today. Most importantly, we thank you for Jesus, who died for us, so that we can be reconciled with you. And it's through his most precious name we pray. Amen. John? Amen. Sure. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Our first song this morning, stand and join us. Sing, we're singing about our God. How great he is, how strong he is, how he's a part of our lives. Amen. <laughs>
a seat, but hopefully I can remember John 3.16. Say, say it with me if you would like. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our last song this morning is, Oh, How You Love You and Me. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, and today's uh, communion meditation. I want to talk about covenant. And before Jesus went to the cross, he celebrated his Passover with, with his disciples. And they went to the upper room, and uh, when they on the table, Jesus gave thanks and broke the bread. They said. Uh, and gave it to the disciples and said, take this bread and eat it. This is my body. And after, after, after the, the same way, he took the cup and said, uh, give to the disciples and said, drink this. This is the blood of the new covenant. This is uh, my blood. It's a blood for the new covenant. So to understand the new covenant, because if you are familiar, you're not familiar with there's another covenant. The old covenant is with Moses. Moses is the mediator of the old covenant. The old covenant is the Ten Commandments, it's the law. Okay, you're wondering why Jesus has the new covenant. The, co the old covenant is the law, it's perfect. But the problem is not the law, the problem is the human heart. The law cannot change the heart, only God can change the heart. So, uh, uh, because the heart is desperately wicked, who can understand the heart? So, God promised another covenant. It's in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 31, and, uh, and also in Hebrew 8. God promised a new covenant. He said, I will make another new covenant. Uh, he said, the Israel and Judah. But that, this covenant is applied to us. If you believe in Jesus Christ, you are Abraham's seed. Okay, uh, this, new this new covenant will be in Jesus Christ. So, uh, he said in the new covenant, he said that God promised this children I will write instead of uh, the law, write in the table, in, in the stone. 
He said, this time I'm going to write the law into the heart. When, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you're born again, the Holy Spirit will come in and write the Ten Commandments in your heart. And in your mind, he said, I will write the law in your mind and in your heart. And I will be your God and you're going to be my people. So you can read it in, uh, you can read it in uh, Jeremiah 31, 31 and also in Hebrew. So you can, you, you know, if you want to take a look. At so th this new covenant is prepared in Jesus Christ. So if you're born again, you cannot help but do the will of God. This, the, this, uh, this new covenant in Jesus Christ is pure love, it's grace. So uh, every time, every time we take the communion, you know, in Jesus Christ, you know, in the in, uh, in, uh, covenant with Moses, he used, uh, after Moses received the law, they killed an animal. And Moses sprinkled the blood of animals the people. This is the blood of, but in Jesus Christ, he used his own blood for, for, for this, uh, for this uh, occasion. So if you, every time you take this, it's like the communion, we celebrate. We celebrate this uh, covenant with God. So if you, if you are a believer, the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit will come in and write the law into your heart. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that uh, that you write, you promise the new covenant that you write your law into your, in, into our hearts. That we cannot help it, but obey you. We obey you because we love you. In Jesus' name, let me pray. And the principle of giving is like uh, I want to just give you the giving is privilege. So it's just a it's just a principle of giving. And uh, if you give, just give generously. <laughs> it's just a principle of giving. It's a prayer. You decide what how much you give, and also uh, give cheerfully. Uh, just trust God that God will provide. Thank you. Church, as you can see now, it's announcements. Since uh, Matt isn't here, we're gonna have a short service today, I think, and unless Dan gets on some tangents today. So, um, our defending the faith classes has moved its dates. We're no longer gonna be on Fridays, but we're gonna be on every other Thursday evening, starting on two eight, February eighth. So keep in mind, it's not the first Fridays anymore. Uh, we have some guest speakers coming in. George Bozeman will be here on 2-11. Uh, Jeremy Ferguson will be here on March 3rd. Our 40 days of prayer will start on, or 41 days, whichever the case may be. Uh, we'll start on February 20th and end on Easter. Uh, work day coming up on March Ninth, and we got some things planned. Uh, but if you have something special that you want to do, let us know. Maybe we can figure out if we can do it, or if it's feasible, or what we can do with it. Um, Easter, 
sunrise service at 6.52 a.m. down at the ocean, uh, at the beach. That's sunrise. Sunrise. You should get there about 6.45. Yeah, get, this, get there a little bit early, I'm sure. Uh, we hadn't talked about this, but we usually have a breakfast uh, following sometime. Service at the regular time, and uh, again, the 40 days of, 41 days of prayer will end at that time. So, um, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we come and gather in your house. We thank you for the fellowship that we have. We thank you for your blessings that you give us, Father. Father, may our plans be your plans. May you uh, bless each and every one of them. And, well, Father, help us grow your church. Help us to build your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I see that uh, Rhonda has put up that I'm supposed to speak in Revelation, so we're done, because y'all know I don't speak in Revelation, right? <laughs> All right. Let's see if I can get this situated here. Dismiss the kids and teachers. Yes, thank you, Joe. They don't want to listen to me anyway. I'm boring. <laughs> well. Since Matt caught me at short notice, I thought I would do something for you that I never do for you. I would do something from Revelation and talk about God on his throne. God reigns. God is always on his throne. And we find out that God is always on his throne and we find him voice of encouragement, if you've not already done so, uh, turn to Revelation 19.6 and you'll see what I mean. John records a vision that he had. And it was not just a vision, but it was multifaceted. What he records there in Revelation is, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters, and like loud peals of thunder, shouting hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Think about that. Our Lord God Almighty reigns. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes it looks like the throne of God, the throne of our Lord who reigns the universe, who created the universe, is actually empty. We look around us, we see violence, we see crime. When I bought the house in my neighborhood, there wasn't any. Across the street from me lived a police officer. He's long moved out. There are shootings. The stores in my neighborhood have closed, they're all boarded up. Even the bars in my neighborhood have closed down. So now I'm going to tell you something. The neighborhood I, we bought, uh, when we bought that house, we made a stipulation with the realtor. She was the wife of one of the elders here. Uh, you know, I, I got a map of Norfolk out, and I got a compass, and I drew a circle around Colonial Heights, around the church, not the neighborhood and said I wanted to be within two miles of this and I wanted to be in the best school district that was in that area. And it turned out that Norview was the best school district and it happened to be a good neighborhood. 
Check the statistics today. No longer. And then all my kids have moved to Chesapeake. That ought to tell you something, right? We see the violence, we see the crime, but we don't see the justice any longer. Where is the justice? Lies prosper and truth fades away. Sometimes it seems as if evil is in total control of this beautiful world that God has made. And it causes us to wonder, why do we trust the Lord? Why do we trust Christ and try to be obedient to him? Wouldn't it be just so much easier to give in to the world and what they're doing and go with the flow? The Apostle John lived in a world that's not too much different from ours. It just didn't have the technology that we have. The crime was there. Things weren't much different. And when he wrote the book of Revelation, he wasn't sitting in a comfortable chair. He wasn't in a college library or a church study. He wasn't surrounded by students. He wasn't surrounded by admiring fellows. No, when John wrote the book of Revelation, he was a prisoner. He was exiled on the Isle of Patmos. He was surrounded by the waters of the Aegean Sea. Have you ever been there? I have. It's very choppy water. Not fun to be there at all. Especially when you're usually pulling the mid-watch. They're not fun, are they? No, I, I see some sailors over here going, mm -hmm. no. <laughs> Talk to me sometime later about the mid-watch on Christmas Eve. That was hilarious. <laughs> John was separated from everyone he loved. He was alone in his exile. So imagine this, here's an old man, he's coming to the end of his life. He's in exile, he's alone, no loved ones to support him. And he's suffering for his faith. But yet he wrote this book, this revelation that he was given by the Spirit and it's not about his trials and his tribulations. It's about Jesus. It's about the Messiah. It is about the triumphs of Christ. He doesn't write, woe is me, Caesar's on the throne. No, that is not the language of faith. What does he write? Look at that verse again in your Bibles. He writes, hallelujah, the Lord our God is on his throne. How many of us can do that? How many of us can make that claim? How many of us, when we're suffering, can stand around and say, hallelujah, because the Lord Almighty reigns? You all know there's been some deaths in this church recently. And there's been some families that are still reeling. And yet, can we still say, hallelujah, our God reigns. Our families know that the loss of our loved ones knew Jesus. And we can still claim hallelujah. Right, Marcy? I'd ask my wife, but she's already taken the little ones to teach. Yes, we can. We do claim hallelujah. But the majority of people in the world cannot do that. When they suffer, they complain because they don't have Jesus. But sometimes we don't have that. Sometimes the suffering is so bad and we are so frustrated because of the hurt what do we do? If we turn to our BFF 
and we look for solace. We seek comfort. We need that hug. We want physical comfort because of the hurts that we have. While sometimes that may seem to be the best thing to do, I'm telling you the best comfort you can find is in the Lord. And I'm not telling you don't go seek that hug. I like hugs. They're very comforting. But the best comfort you're going to find is found in the Lord. Now, going back to that throne. That's not working. Matt doesn't bring his Bible. He brings a little tablet he hangs on the edge. <laughs> going back to the, to the throne. It may seem that that throne is empty, but I'm telling you that the throne of the universe is not empty. God is still on his throne. God is Lord. But in John's day, there was somebody else that tried to usurp that position. In John's day, every Roman citizen had to go annually to some altar, some temple somewhere, and drop incense into the burner and claim Caesar is Lord. And he had to be recorded, or she had to be recorded by the priest that was there. That was a requirement in Roman occupied territory. Annually, you had to do this. John wouldn't do that dedicated, faithful followers of the way. The term Christian didn't come about until the year 43, a good decade after Jesus was crucified. Christians would not do that. John wouldn't do that. He stood up boldly and he said, Jesus Christ is Lord, not Caesar. And because of that, they arrested him. And that's why we find him on the Isle of Patmos right now, writing this book. He could very well have been executed. But that was not meant to be. Take a look at John 21, 22, if you will. Sorry, as I said, this was short notice, so I don't have PowerPoint. I just gave Rhonda the heading. John 21, 22. This was right after... Jesus reinstated Peter after Peter had denied Jesus three times. Then he asked Jesus, or Jesus asked Peter three times on the beach, do you love me? And Peter got quite annoyed with that. And finally looked over there and saw John standing there and said, well, what about him? Why aren't you asking him all these questions? Listen to Jesus' reply. Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is it to you? It wasn't meant for John to be executed. Jesus had other plans for him. And John was the only disciple of Jesus from that inner circle who did not die a horrific death. He died of old age because Jesus loved him dearly. But John didn't see himself as a prisoner of, of Caesar. John considered himself to be a prisoner of Jesus Christ. John did not consider himself suffering while he was in exile. He considered himself suffering because he was in exile. The glory of Jesus. And that is not suffering at all. So John looked at it and said, no matter how dark it is, no matter how heavy my burden is, I can say, hallelujah, the Lord God Almighty reigns. How many of us do that? How many of us get up 
from our frustrations? How many of us get up from the hurt, from the suffering, and say, hallelujah, God reigns? We don't do that. We get into our pity parties. And we get other people to come over and join us in those. After all, that's what besties are for, right? No. We need to say, hallelujah, God still reigns. We have a lesson that we need to learn from John. And that lesson is that God reigns today. He has not abdicated. Regardless of what the world will tell you, God reigns today. I think the newsboys put it best. God's not dead. If you haven't watched that video, just a short little song, it's great. I think they even turned it into a movie. Maybe more than one. Say again? More than one. More than one, yeah, yeah. It's great, you need to watch it. God has not abdicated, and he has definitely not turned the universe over to the adversary. Now, it's true that the adversary is functioning here on this earth, but it's also true that we can resist him and we can get all the help we need in doing so. And it's true that the world is gonna continue being contrary to the Lord's will. But where God does not rule, he overrules. And God's purposes will always be fulfilled. After all, he is the Lord. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. So we can feel totally confident that we can entrust our lives. We can entrust our loved ones into the hands of God. So when you find yourselves discouraged, when you find yourselves worried, when you find yourselves afraid, just remember, what did John say? Our Lord God reigns. Let me give some words from Jesus. John 17, verses 20 through 23. That's small print. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as, and that you have loved, we'll get there. <laughs> May they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. You ever notice when you tilt your head with bifocals that you get more than one image? <laughs> you should drive me nuts on the ships. Get my head in there and I'd look and I'd see more than one particular screw I'm supposed to be working on. Terrible, terrible. But the thing is, is that God's love has filtered down to us through Jesus because they're in, they are one together and Jesus has prayed for us to receive that love also. And what Jesus asks of the Father, the Father gives. And so there's our secret. That's our secret of peace. That's our secret of joy amid a very troubled world. So remember that. When the adversary starts pinging on you, and he will, there's no doubt in my mind that the adversary will reach out. Because he already owns those people in the world. He wants the people in here. So this is where the effort will be. And this is also 
how the prophet Isaiah found strength when his world fell apart. Isaiah was a prophet to the kingdom of Judah. The kingdom of Judah was ruled by King Uzziah. He was a man who did a lot of good things for his people. But everybody has to die. And when King Uzziah died, Isaiah thought his world was going to come to an end. And so in the sixth chapter of Isaiah, he tells us about this. Verse 1, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on a throne, high and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Oh, think about that. Being invited to see the Lord in his temple. What a sight that must have been. The throne is not empty. The one on earth may be, but the one in heaven where God rules from is definitely filled. And Isaiah was privileged. Isaiah got to see that. He got to see the throne filled. On earth, people are mourning. But in heaven, there were praises going on. The seraphim were praising. Skip down to verse 3. Tiny numbers. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty, and the earth is full of his glory. Now, if the earth is full of his glory, how can we say his throne is empty? It is not. The vision that Isaiah saw of God on his throne transformed this young man. It made him a new man entirely. And instead of sitting around and complaining and looking for a BFF on whose shoulder he could cry, he did something entirely different. And those of you who have been in my classes have heard me quote this next verse repeatedly and throw it out at you repeatedly. Look down at verse 8. Tiny numbers. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And I said, Here am I. Send me. When is the last time in the midst of your frustrations, in the midst of your mourning, have you stood up and said, Here am I. I need a new job to get over this grief. Give me something different to do. Send me. There's still a lot of work to be done in settling Jean's affairs. And I won't say that I did this to Matt. But I've been praying the last couple of days for my ministries to expand. So here I am, here I am standing in front of you now instead of Matt. It's been a while since I've preached. It wasn't what I had in mind when I made that prayer the other day, but here I am. I was kind of thinking about the devotions that I put out. But I guess this could be called one also, because it is devoted to God. But how many times in our frustrations do we just lean on somebody else instead of the Lord? He is the one who's going to bring us out. Hugs are great. But they can't solve it. We need to turn to the Lord. Paul had a similar experience. In the 18th chapter of Acts, Paul was in Corinth. 
he'd come to Corinth to preach. In fact, we're studying the letter, first letter to the Corinthians on Wednesday nights. No. If you're not involved in that class, uh, give Matt or myself your email address and we'll get you involved in that class. But Paul had come to the city of Corinth to preach. He wanted to establish a church. He did. But when he left Corinth, that church had a lot of trouble. Corinth was a pretty wicked city. It was a, on the crossroads. It was a seaport. A lot of sailors. Not all sailors are Christians. And the opposition of the adversary was overwhelming. And Paul, at one point, felt like quitting. But he got another vision from Jesus. Not quite as startling as the one he had in Acts chapter 9, but he had another vision from Jesus. Look at Acts 18, verses 9 and 10. Here we go with the tiny numbers again. Oh, there we go. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. Paul was there for 18 months. One of his longest places where he witnessed and where he established a church. What made the difference? God was still on the throne and Paul discovered that fact. That's what we have to do. We have to make that same discovery. It's a very difficult world out there and they don't like us because we're different. And we can't depend upon ourselves. We can't depend on our own rule because we're weak. We're ignorant. We can't depend on the rule of others because they are also weak and ignorant. So what can we depend on? We depend on God. We depend on Jesus because the rule the reign of Jesus as Lord and Savior is there. If he's on the throne of our lives, just as he's on the throne in heaven, then we can face anything with courage, with confidence, with the knowledge that we can get through any issue that the adversary throws at us. If Jesus is there, then our hope is still alive. Now, receiving earthly encouragement from your BFF is a great thing. I am not telling you to kick your BFF to the curb, okay? Uh, I have to say it again. You know, I love hugs. They're great things, all right? But your BFF is only human, as you are. Have they ever let you down? Certainly they have. They're only human. Okay? But has Christ ever let you down? No. So put your faith in the dependability of Christ, who has never let you down. But keep your BFF. Because they're good people. Now, there are those who are greatly concerned about the age-old problem of evil in the world. Evil has been here since the garden. We're never going to get rid of it until Jesus returns. Okay? And those people cannot understand why God, who is a loving God, who is a powerful God, an all-powerful God, would permit such atrocities and evils to occur. Well, you missed a great discussion Friday night 
because that was the topic of our Defending the Faith class Friday evening. Okay? Now, you want a really detailed explanation. There's some extra handouts in the classroom behind me. Please go get one. All right? And if you want more information, you can see Sam or myself or Joe or Mike who skipped out on me or Matt when he comes back. Okay? We have that information, but the handouts, there's extra handouts in the classroom. Please go help yourself. Now, God allows these things to happen because we have free will. That's the bottom line. People choose to do those things. And God lets them do it because the other thing is if he forces them not to, Where's the love and forcing? All right? But go get a handout. Now, what is all of that evil? What are all those atrocities? Simply put, the rebellion against God. God is not to blame for all of those things. That is the result of sin. And because of the power of free will, man chooses to sin. Those are the wrong choices. We all make choices. And when we make the wrong choices, there are consequences. Amen. The biggest problem is not the presence of evil in this world. It's the presence of good. Think about that. Let me say that again. The biggest problem is not the presence of evil in this world. It's the presence of good. The fact that God has not poured out his judgments on mankind is to me a bigger problem than the evils we see men inflicting on each other. Think about that. God's on his throne. He has the power to judge this world right now but yet he restrains his wrath. Why? Because it's not the day of judgment, it's the day of salvation. And we can say hallelujah, for God reigns. He chooses, though, to reign in grace and not in wrath. Think about it. If God reigned in wrath, we wouldn't be here. Nobody would be here. But we get it best from Peter. Second Peter 3, 9. Yeah, it's in here somewhere. Peter says, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand promises. Excuse me, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And please, don't get the idea that because God has not judged the world's sin, or your sin, that he is not going to do it at all. Judgment Day is coming. But right now, God is being patient with us. I think we talked about that in Sunday school. God is being patient with us. God is lovingly and graciously inviting everyone to turn to Jesus, to trust him to be saved through the name of Jesus and to be baptized in his name. One of these hours, the day of grace will be gone and the day of wrath will begin and it'll be too late. And even Jesus doesn't know when that's going to happen. 
The throne of grace at that point is going to become a throne of judgment and justice. And if you have not placed your faith and your trust in Jesus by that time, it is too late. Have you ever humbled yourself before God's throne? Have you yielded your life to Christ? He died in your place on that cross. He took your sins to the cross. He forgave you from the cross. Why? To save you from judgment. To give you eternal life. So, are you really glad that Christ is reigning on his throne? Is he reigning over your life? Is he on the throne of your heart? And can you say, hallelujah, the Lord God Almighty reigns. Thank you for your time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus, for what he did for us. We also thank you for your patience to give us a time when we can truly say we're sorry. Forgive us. And thank you for reigning, for the throne not being empty. Hallelujah, Lord, for you reign. Bless us now, Father, as we move into the week's activities. May they all be pleasing in your sight. And keep us all safe and return those who are missing to us safely that we can once again join in our fellowship. And once more, we just thank you for Jesus who died for us, that we can be reconciled with you. And it's through his most precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you and have a blessed week. Turn off the recording.